ao Sr. Dr. Jeffrey Zayd. Eu passo a palavra ao Mestre Simónias, por favor. Boa tarde a todos. Sejam bem-vindos à cerimónia de imposição de insígnias doutorais ao professor Jeffrey Kappa Zeig. Good afternoon. We welcome you to the ceremony of Professor Jeffrey K. Zeig's imposition of doctoral insignia. Senhoras e senhores convidados, professores, funcionários e alunos, peço a vossa atenção para a leitura da ata da reunião em que o Conselho da Reitoria da Universidade de Fernando Pessoa deliberou sobre o título que vai ser hoje outorgado. Ladies and gentlemen, professors, employees and students, I call your attention to the reading of the minute of the meeting of the University of Fernando Pessoa's Rector Council that decided on the title that will be, that will be conferred today. Aos cinco dias do mês de março do ano de 2018, pelas 15 horas, na Universidade de Fernando Pessoa, situada na Praça 9 de Abril, número 349, no Porto, reuniu o Conselho da Reitoria da Universidade, sob a presidência do Sr. Reitor, Professor Dr. Salvato Trigo. On the 5th of March of 2018, by 3 p.m., at University Fernando Pessoa, located at Praça 9 de Abril, number 349, in Porto, The Rector's Council met, chaired by the Rector, Professor Salvato Trigo. Estiveram presentes o Sr. Diretor da Faculdade de Ciência e Tecnologia, Professor Dr. Álvaro Monteiro, o Sr. Diretor da Faculdade de Ciências da Saúde, Professor Dr. Luís Martins, e as coordenadoras pedagógico-administrativas das faculdades, Dra. Ana Carla Novaes e Dra. Lourdes Soeiro were present the director of the Faculty of Science and Technology, Professor Álvaro Monteiro, the director of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Luís Martins, and the pedagogical and administrative faculties coordinators, Ms. Ana Carla Novaes and Ms. Lourdes Soeiro. A Sra. Diretora da Faculdade de Ciências Humanas e Sociais, Professor Dr. Inês Gomes, ausente nesta reunião por motivos pessoais, enviou à consideração deste Conselho a atribuição de doutoramento honoris causa ao Sr. Professor Dr. Jeffrey K. Zeig. O Dr. Jeffrey K. Zeig é psicólogo e psicoterapeuta, contando com uma vasta experiência clínica de quatro décadas, desde 1977. Em 1979, fundou a Milton H. Erickson Foundation, com sede em Phoenix, Arizona, sendo, desde essa altura, o diretor desta instituição de formação de profissionais na área da saúde mental. The director of the Faculty of Human and Social Sciences, Professor Inês Gomes, absent at this meeting for, for personal reasons, sent to the consideration of this council the appointment of Dr. Honoris Causa to Professor Dr. Jeffrey K. Zeig. Dr. Jeffrey K. Zeig is a psychologist and psychotherapist with extensive clinical experience of four decades, since 1977. Sorry. In 1979, he founded the Milton H. Erickson Foundation, headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona, and has been the director of this institution for training mental health professionals. A proposta apresentada mereceu a aprovação deste Conselho. The proposal was approved by this council. Muito obrigado, Sr. Dr. Ana Cláudia Moutinho. Na continuação da cerimónia, eu vou passar a palavra ao padrinho do nosso homenageado de hoje, o Sr. Dr. Jeff Zeck, e vai usar da palavra, por isso, o padrinho do nosso Dr. Honoris Causa. Palavra para o Sr. Professor, por favor. Ok. Uh, dear Rector, dear colleagues, dear students of the Ferdinand, Fernando Pessoa University, as a professor of the Rome Sapienza University, I, Camilo Loriedo, have the pleasure and the honor to introduce to you Jeffrey K. Zeig. Jeffrey gave a lot of contribution of excellence to the entire science of psychology, of psychotherapy, and of Ericksonian hypnosis. Uh, he is a master of organization. He, he did the first conference in 1980 dedicated to Milton Erickson, 
And I think it was the most successful conference I have ever uh, attended in my life. And he was really very, very young at that moment. I was asking to myself, how is this possible that a young man like this can organize a Congress, such a big Congress, and uh, almost the most important people in the world were there. So he was able then to, to uh, construct and build and uh, literally uh, activate in the world the Ericsson Foundation the foundation dedicated to Milton Erickson that was the innovator in the field of hypnosis and psychotherapy. And uh, he, he created a lot of conferences during uh, the time from that moment on, uh, dedicated to brief therapy, to couple therapy, and best of all, the evolution of psychotherapy. A revolutionary way of uh, organizing congresses in which all the best people, all the masters of psychotherapy were obliged to be there and confront with each other. So the important idea was uh, that even if I am the greatest in the world, I have to confront with other colleagues. I think that was a revolution in the field because up to that moment, people were thinking I am the best and uh, they had to deal with uh, equal other colleagues and uh, to have dialogues with them, to uh, start to begin, they, they were not the only one who had the truth in their life. So th there was a radical change in the field of psychotherapies because of this type of organization that was unique. Never happened in other uh, sciences to have uh, all the scientists, the best scientists, to confront with each other. Literally all the big names were there. And some of them say, well, I'm a little bit in, in difficulty speaking with the other colleagues, but the rule was that everybody was supposed to interact with others. Psychics is a, a good example in a field in which people can think that they arrive to the top to be humble and to meet with other colleagues. And also the attendees, they were uh, absolutely enthusiastic to see the masters confronting with each other to understand where the master is uh, in a difficulty and when is really able to confront with colleagues. Uh, diffusion of, con of knowledge in the field of psychotherapy. Uh, he was able to introduce everywhere the idea of Milton Erickson and the Milton Erickson uh, uh, kind of therapy. Uh, it was uh, enough known when he started, but not so much. And also there were countries in which hypnosis uh, in the sense of Ericsson didn't exist. And uh, to know and to follow these ideas was uh, crucial because it changed the mentality. Uh, I just mentioned something that is a little bit technical, the idea, the idea of resistance that was considered something that uh, is a moment in which a therapist finds difficulty in changing the client. Erickson and Jeff, they were promoting the idea that uh, the client resists when you do a wrong therapy. So you, you have to uh, be attentive to resistance because it's the moment in which the therapist learns how to change himself and to change the therapy. So it's a revolution in a field in which um, up to that moment was considered that the therapist was the absolute uh, owner of the power to change the others and not change himself. Uh, a lot of papers, uh, a lot of volumes, uh, and the Ericsson Archives and Museum. Uh, so the Ericsson Archives, I recommend it to you because it has a lot, a great, masters speaking about psychotherapy and presenting their way of working and also confronting with the real situations in which they were supposed to intervene. If you want to know something about psychotherapy, if you really want to see what is psychotherapy, uh, you will find in uh, the, the, the videos that uh, there are in, uh, in uh, Ericsson archives. I think it's a unique opportunity also for universities and the museums that is the house in which Ericsson was living was uh, rebuilt and transformed in a museum by, by Jeff, by his work. 
And uh, another way of diffusing knowledge is this that is very recent, the idea of giving a five minute suggestion to the people that can learn how to deal with difficult situation. In a critical situation, what you do? Well, everybody is very jealous of his knowledge. Jeff is so generous to present it for free in, uh, in the website of the Milton Erickson Foundation good advices and good uh, techniques uh, and how to deal with difficult cases. Uh, Erickson uh, was a good teacher, but he was such a talented man that was very difficult to reproduce it. Jeff Zeig made it possible because uh, uh, when you watch Erickson, you see this is not for me because it was too good, too excellent, but it was not simple to learn. So you can watch for hours, but then you see, you think in yourself, I will never be able to do things like that. So what Jeff was able to do is to teach in a simple way. I'm um, uh, reproducing here just an example. This is the diamond uh, in which every therapy can be uh, subdivided uh, in order to make a very simple and easy access to difficult therapies and teaching, he was able to use simple words and also, in time, even simple gestures. Because it was supposed for a long time that a psychotherapist cannot do gestures, but uh, Jeff studied how to do a gesture therapist. Uh, he was able to move in the room and was able to, to speak uh, in a different tone of voice. So, a uh, uh, paraverbal, communication, nonverbal communication, very simple and easy to learn, and he was teaching to everybody how to use it. Also, was not invented by Jeff, but I think Jeff is one that did the most, the most uh, uh, important number of cases of live interviews. So he was teaching by practicing, not only by words. So I admire the people who have the, who has the courage, who have the courage to uh, show to an audience of 7,000, 10,000 people, like Jeff did in organizing big conferences, show himself doing therapy in front of everybody and not knowing before what he's expecting to you. So he did this so many times in his life. Uh, you, you can see probably many videos that are uh, in the website, but also in uh, YouTube, everywhere, because uh, Jeff is so generous, he never protects himself, not showing what he did in his life. So the live interviews are certainly a very important part of his teaching. And uh, the, uh, this is to show you that another important part in teaching is the fact that he had on the left of the big picture, the therapist. Because before, people were thinking only to the client to think how to change the client. But what happens to the therapist? What the therapist should do? So Jeff added to the diamond the idea of including the therapist. And uh, I remember that when I was teaching and I was taught uh, as a psychotherapist, there were maps of uh, families, maps of individuals, but the therapist was never on the scheme. I think it's important to consider what is the most delicate part of the therapy, that is the therapist, because we have to survive to all the most difficult cases and not to become, uh, in some way, patients ourselves. So, and humor. Well, Jeff is, uh, the therapy of Jeff, as always, a very subtle, never too much intense, uh, but it's very subtle and convincing humor. Those are some of the jokes that he was uh, here. You can see him uh, in a motorcycle with uh, Milton Erickson. So, you know, is uh, and uh, the the cards that have been created by Arizona therapy a way of being humorous with yourself. That's another important part of the therapist's work. Uh, aggregation. You see here how many people and. Maybe you recognize many of these people. They are very famous. All the ones who are in the fold of psychotherapy, 
they know him, they, them, because uh, was, uh, I, in my opinion, was impossible for everyone else in the world to connect all these people together. So everyone was knowing each other, but they never met, and he aggregated them and created a movement. And you can imagine also to be exposed to different approaches, how is good for the students, because I don't know only one approach that usually happens to every student, but he was able to have all these people teach together and to record. So that's the material that is in the foundation. Uh, innovation. Uh, I think uh, Jeff was innovative uh, because uh, he started for, uh, with, with the idea of creating space for Ericksonian therapy, but uh, he went over. In, in the field of Ericksonian hypnosis and psychotherapies, there was the idea of uh, induction. Induction means that you put something in a client. It, the induction is made in order to create hypnosis, but it's also made to induct someone or in someone, something from the therapist. The idea of creating evocative communication that is something that come out, comes out from the client and gives to the therapist the opportunity to do the therapy. So it's like eliciting continuously and make a patient responsive to your suggestions later when you see that you reacted uh, to the uh, client in front of you, and he will react to you, she will react to you. So the evocative communication was an innovation. And um, I found that in some way, since I'm here, I was thinking about Portugal. And you say Custodio de Faria is the Abate Faria, and the Abate Faria, the Abbe Faria, how it's called everywhere in the world, was innovative too, like Jeff. And I think uh, his ideas, are the roots that uh, uh, even today we have to remember. Because the Abbe Faria was the man who said hypnosis is not sleep. And uh, sleep was meant uh, to signify that the client was sleeping while the therapist was doing the work. So a passive situation in which you induce something and uh, the client has to take it. That's it. With the evocative therapy, the process is bilateral, and you evoke from the client ideas, and you give back other ideas to the client, other emotions. You receive them. And the Abbe Faria had this idea from the very beginning. And another part was that he was able to recognize that the relationship that is in psychotherapy, and in particular in hypnotherapy, the bilateral situation in which you influence the patient only if you accept to be influenced by him or her. So that's uh, an, a view that uh, is innovative and has roots in the past. I think this is the best to connect past and present ideas and to develop them. I think Jeff did it so well. So since uh, we are here, let me say that I'm honored to be in the Fernando Pessoa University, great poet, and I think if you allow me to say that even Jeff is a great poet of psychotherapy. So, uh, dear rector, I'm asking you if uh, it's possible to conceive the idea of uh, giving to Jeff Zeig the honorary doctorate. Thank you very much, Professor Camilo Laurier. Thank you very much for your words. I have sought to speak a little bit about, about the Faria, but uh, you, you did my work. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sarebbe stato più facile. After the lecture of Professor Camille Laurier, your godfather, <laughs> I think that the assembly knows you as an eminent 
specialist in this area of hypnosis and psychotherapy. That's why we decided to appoint you as Dr. Honoris Causa of our university. And using my academic authority, I declare Dr. Jeffrey Zeig, Dr. Honoris Causa by our, by our university. And so I'm presenting you the doctoral insignia. First of all, our gown, the most important the most important phrase I had in my life about the university is written in the front of the University of Oxford. University of Oxford in the front of the big, the principal building is written there. The university is where the gown meets the town. <laughs> <laughs> then Dr. Jeff Zai, our gown for you as you see the symbol of our identity as a university. I'm going just to do my work. It's nice, thank you. Sir. Okay, now the medal. The medal is our recognition for your CV. Then the color, it's the Portuguese color for psychology, the orange. Huh? Okay. And finally, the diploma certifying your eminence in the area of psychology and psychotherapy. It's for you, sir. Thank you very much. Huh? Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to our university. You can come with me now. falo português. Um, quando a gente fala Jeva Gar, não entendo. Uh -huh. um, mas uh, eu falo inglês muito simples uh, e uh, obrigado por tudo. So what an unusual way to start a presentation, one that I can only uh, hope expresses some of my gratitude for this extraordinary honor. I'm honored by the uh, rector and by the dean and by my friend Camilo and uh, all of you for being present at an extraordinary honor and I deeply, deeply uh, appreciate it. I uh, hope to continue to deserve it. So um, this uh, presentation, what I started with, is an idea of signification. It's an idea of awakening a representation. And we awaken representations by using signals more than using words. So I decided to start the presentation by giving you signals, common signals that awaken a representation. Now this is part of our evolutionary sociobiology that representations awaken 
a concept, they awaken a state, they awaken an identity when it comes to human beings. And psychotherapy has been plagued, as Camilo has said, by my mouth to your ears, your mouth to my ears, and therapists haven't gotten the idea even of making therapy into a visual experience. If 50% of brain processing is dedicated to vision, we need to make things come alive to awaken representations in our clients that help to propel our clients into more adaptive states, more adaptive identities. But that's not only relevant to psychotherapists. This is also relevant to teachers. There are some concepts that need to be presented in a way that makes a simple idea come alive conceptually, not only relevant to teachers, but relevant to parents. When we want to communicate a concept, we need to use a form of communication that is a little bit uncommon in academic circles. It's not commonly taught how to present things in an evocative way. My area of exploration has been evocative communication. Now, what I'll show you next is an actual psychological experiment. I'm going to show you two women the women are exactly the same, it's the same woman. And when uh, asked, and uh, the experiment is actually run, the, uh, one of the women is judged statistically significant amount of time as being more attractive than the other. So we will pretend that we exist in a democracy, at least as from being from the United States, I'm less certain about that, but uh, here's the woman. This is picture number one, it's, uh, and here is picture number two, it's the same woman. So this is uh, picture, num uh, picture number one, picture number two. Now because of the way in which the lighting is on the screen, uh, the, the effect can't be ac accurately re realized here. But the simple change in this is that in this picture, picture number one, her pupils are retouched, they're dilated. And in picture number two, this is her normal pupillary size. When students are at, when uh, people are asked which one is more attractive, because pupillary dilatation is a sign of arousal. If you see an infant, your pupils will dilate because of excitement. In Italy, uh, women uh, uh, of age would use belladonna to create more pupillary dilatation and be more attractive to their suitors. Now, this has to do with the way in which we are built to respond. We are built to respond without the necessity of understanding the cue that led to our response. We are designed that way. We are designed by evolution. We are designed uh, as animals to respond without necessarily realizing the cue that leads to that response. So signification and responsiveness of the type that I'm talking about, these are things that happen unconsciously. We understand this from music. And uh, Beethoven and, uh, did something extraordinary and created the Fifth Symphony. And basically what he did was another theme in this presentation, which is strategic development. In the Fifth Symphony, Beethoven did theme and variation one, two, three, down, one, two, three, down. He created a whole symphony out of theme and variation on one, two, three, down, and had that have strategic development. There's a slight delay in the uh, presentation, but I think we'll hear it. Uh, and this is a visual representation of the fifth symphony. We'll just listen to a small part of it. And what you will hear is recursions. Slight recursion.
even the variation from the, the horn that introduces the major theme from the minor theme is still one, two, three down. And then this is being done to evoke a response in you. These are the four most widely known notes in all of Western music, two tones, four notes and meant to evoke something. Now, this, the, what Beethoven is doing is strategic development. What he's also doing is using recursions. Those of you who are present at the demonstration that I did earlier today saw me use this Beethoven principle. I was working as a composer, doing strategic development, but I was also frequently using recursions, speaking in sets of three. Now, this is not only something that's used by Beethoven, but also by great orators. I think that Bill Clinton, past President Clinton, was one of the most wonderful of orators, and he would use recursions in his speech as a way of strategic development of an idea. Perhaps he would be saying, we need to talk about the economy. We need to work on sound fiscal principles. We need to be responsible in our monetary policy. We just said the same thing three times. Well, if this is good enough for Beethoven, if this is good enough for Bill Clinton, then I want to take some of the codes that are found in art and be able to use them because art is essentially evocative. We are um, over-trained in a world that's factual, where we believe that giving people information is the royal road to change, but when we want, to, when we want somebody to realize a concept, then we can't rely on the logical linear communication that's necessary in order to send a spaceship to Mars. So my presentation is about evocative communication, which I would call limbic communication or signifying communication. Signification, just one of many processes where we respond without the necessity of understanding what the cue that led to the response, we respond automatically. And this has to do with something that I never learned in training, how do I use all of the output channels of communication? How can I use my voice, my tone, my tempo, my gesture, my posture, my gaze, my proximity, the prosody of my voice in order to have a strategic effect when I'm working with a client? To help a client actualize uh, an adaptive change in his or her life. But those of you who are teachers are also um, struck with the same thing, to be able to really understand poetry, to be able to understand uh, how to compose music, but to be able to understand the principles that are underlying physics if we move into the quantum world, you're no longer able to teach something in a logical, linear way. There are skips where somebody has to realize a concept. So, I will make this available later today, but I'm sure now the uh, university has this handout so they can have a better way of, of presenting it to people, but it's jeffreyzeig.com forward slash handouts forward slash porto 2018, and I uh, will be uh, glad to make this uh, available to people. So in 1973, I was 26 years old, I got the opportunity to study with Milton Erickson which was remarkable. You can't see much of Erickson there. He was confined to a wheelchair the last 13 years of his life. He was one of the most preeminent psychiatrists of the 20th century. And when I met him, his vision was double, his hearing was impaired, he didn't wear a denture in his mouth, he had an actor's control of his voice and had to relearn how to speak. His hearing was impaired, he was breathing in a labored way, half a diaphragm and a few intercostal muscles, and uh, constant chronic pain, and perfumed the atmosphere with, of course you can, enjoy life. In course you can change. Of course you can go into a trance. Of course you can cope adequately with whatever fate life gives you. It was a tremendously 
moving human being. The second day that I was there, I, I had tears streaming down my face that this genius was spending his time trying to inspire a young student to be a better person. Now, Erickson was a very unusual communicator, and lots of people were baffled by the things that he did, but if we conceive him in a very simple way, that Erickson was a conceptual communicator, he didn't communicate facts. He wrote 140 papers. There's many books about his work that he contributed to. In writing, he could be linear and descriptive, but in an interpersonal situation, he was always and that is not hyperbole. He was always evocative. He was always working to communicate a concept, a realization, and this uh, made him very difficult for his peers to understand, but if once you could get on to the idea that hypnosis is essentially evocative communication, you don't use hypnosis to give people information. You don't use hypnosis to explain uh, why force equals mass times acceleration. If you're studying basic physics, you use a conceptual communication to evoke an idea of relaxation or happiness or connection or even responsibility. So very unusual communicator. I give you one of my favorite examples. When I was in graduate school, I smoked a pipe and I was the young psychologist pipe smoker. So I had expensive European pipes, I had a custom tobacco, a leather pouch, I had many, a, 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 a pipe rack with different pipes, my own custom blend of tobacco, a silver lighter. I thought, if you're gonna be a, a young psychologist, you should smoke a pipe. <laughs> so I'm visiting Ericsson and uh, He's seeing a patient and I'm sitting in his garden. I was his house guest when I visited him and uh, when I, he saw me smoking a pipe. And so I came in for my session to learn from him as a student and he told me a story about a friend of his and the friend was a pipe smoker. But the friend was awkward because he didn't know where in his mouth to put the pipe. Should he put the pipe in the center of his mouth should he put the pipe one millimeter to the left? Should he put the pipe one centimeter to the right? He was awkward. And the man was awkward because he didn't know how to hold the pipe. Should he hold it with his right hand? Should he hold it with his left hand? Should he use three fingers? Should he use four fingers? He was awkward. And the man was awkward because he didn't know how to blow the smoke out. Should the be in a focus stream, in a diffuse stream, more to the right, more to the left? more up, more down. I'm thinking, I'm not awkward. I've been smoking a pipe for a while. Why is he telling me this story? Well, the man was awkward because he didn't know where to put the pipe down. Should he hold it in his lap? Should he put it on the table? Should he put it on the floor? He was awkward. And the man was awkward because he didn't know how to light the pipe. Should the flame touch the tobacco? Should it be in front of the tobacco? Should it be in back of the tobacco? Now, some of you are laughing. I was not laughing. <laughs> I couldn't get the humor. I was just transfixed by what was going on. Now, I swear to you, that story went on for one hour. <laughs> Erickson was a very slow, methodical speaker who was watching the response that he was getting. And knowing Erickson as I do now, at the end of that hour, I must have gone. <laughs> and the story stopped. Two days later, I was driving back to where I'd lived at the time, California. Erickson was in Phoenix, a thousand uh, miles away, a thousand kilometers away. And I stopped at a stoplight halfway home. I looked up at the light and I said to myself, I have no desire to smoke a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> now, it was my choice. It was my decision. It was my accomplishment. All that Erickson did was to make it so overly conscious that I didn't know how to hold the pipe, I didn't know where to put it in my mouth. And then he kept on going, pipe, awkward, pipe, awkward, pipe. And it was anything at that stage of my life, younger than 30, the last thing that I wanted to do was to look awkward. And he never asked me, Jeff, did you stop smoking a pipe? It was my decision. 
All that he did was to create a context where suddenly I, uh, I had an association that awoke inside me. And that association was that I didn't need to be a pipe smoker anymore. Now, most people wouldn't call that psychotherapy because psychotherapy is when you look for underlying causes, when you try to understand what is the essential anxiety that underlies the symptom, make that conscious. But Erickson was in a different world of using signifying elements to establish a response set, almost as if he was orienting toward, orienting toward, orienting toward, orienting toward, <gasps> until suddenly, those, uh, those uh, associations awoken inside my mind and stimulated responsive behavior. And it was so different than saying to me paternally, cigarettes, smoking is bad for your health, smoking causes lung cancer, it's irresponsible to your body. He just created a, a different emotional background where it became very easy for me to stop smoking. Now, a second example, more of the do, 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 do nature of Erickson. I'm organizing the first Congress when Erickson was alive. He had been my mentor for six, more than six years, and I didn't have the opportunity to say thank you because he never charged me anything for any of his time. So I was at his home. It was getting late in the afternoon, and I'm asking him, what kind of format do you want for the conference and which speakers do you want to have to honor you? And he says, and I'm hyper. I'm you know, trying to get things done and I'm a little hyper anyway, but certainly back then I was even more hyper. And Erickson softly catches my attention visually and says, Jeff. And I say, well, yeah. And he says, you know, it's almost six o'clock. I said, well, yeah, I, I, I know, I understand. And he says, well, you know, I'm confined to a wheelchair. I say, yeah, yeah. And uh, I grew up, as you know, on a farm. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I really like the outdoors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, one of the ways that I get out of the house is that I watch animal shows. Yeah, 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 I, I know. And you know, at six o'clock, my animal program goes on television. <laughs> I know. And if I don't get to watch my animal program, I get angry. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm leaving. <laughs> now, I've never had anybody be angry with me in such an elegant way. <laughs> and it still serves as a reference experience of how to be angry at someone. And it's this strategic development of an idea. And no different than Beethoven playing with three tone, four tones, one, two, three down, and creating an entire symphony out of it. So there's a world of evocative communication. Evocative communication is proto-speech. It's the foundation from which all verbal speech has evolved. And all animals other than human beings, that's arguable, of course, communicate by using uh, signification. They communicate perfectly well, and they're able to adapt to their environment. And animals communicate concepts to each other. It's an instinct of purpose, and it's an instinct of response. There doesn't need to be intention that mediates the cue and the response. One animal communicates, come closer. Another animal communicates, stay away. And we may not understand the essence of the signification, but no conscious mediation is necessary. And we, in psychotherapy world, spend a lot of time trying to get people to consciously mediate rather than to respond and awaken a, uh, an association that can lead them into a more adaptive state. Now, it's the nature of psychological problems that they, they just have to happen. So um, suddenly I looked down at the plate and the plate was empty and I don't even remember eating. So suddenly I walked into the store and I had a panic attack. So most psychological problems have an automaticity. There's a response that is not mediated by any conscious uh, intention. So um, this is uh, seemingly fighting fire with fire. If the problem happens on a level that's more or less automatic, the solution can happen similarly. What we know 
and what we realize is very different. There's one level of a communication that communicates knowing, another level of communication that communicates realizing. There's a grammar for knowing, there's a grammar for realizing. We know that uh, it's good to exercise, it's nice to be kind to people, and you can change your mood, you don't have to be trapped into anxiety or depression but people don't necessarily realize what it is that they know. So a lot of my work is helping people to realize a fact that they already know. And communication, as I'm indicating, is both informative and evocative. And my area of exploration has been, how do we use evocative communication? And this is basically science or phenomenology. Science, we're communicating facts. We need to have somebody understand a formula. Phenomenology is lived experience, and in some way they are opposite. We can put somebody in a, in a functional MRI and know what areas of the brain will be lit up when they're madly in love, but if we want to really understand something about love in a phenomenological way, we have to rely on a poet to help us to experience that. And, uh, Ev evocative communication is a necessity in psychotherapy. We're not communicating facts. We are using ambiguity. I think the great scientist Heisenberg was asked uh, in terms of his complementary, complementarity principle, what is complementary um, uh, to uh, clarity? And uh, he indicated that um, realizations are complementary to clarity, that if you are completely clear about something, you're not going to have a realization. The realization is created by something that is ambiguous. The response tends to be automatic and leads to a change in states. Emotions, simply defined, are fleeting, visceral, adaptive experiences that are directional based on the history of the organism. Emotions tell an organism by virtue of a visceral reaction to move toward or move away, and that's augmented by history. Patients don't have problems with emotions because by definition, emotions are fleeting. Moods are not adaptive. People get trapped into moods. Ah, I'm a hyper mood, or I'm in an angry mood, or I'm in a sad mood and we, people need help in getting out of moods that are calcified emotions that are not adaptive, states are more different. Most uh, people come to me because they're in a state that is ineffective. Rather than being in a connective state, they're disengaged. Rather than being in a cooperative state, they're being oppositional. Sometimes being disengaged is good and sometimes being oppositional is good. But for the most part, people come to psychotherapy because they're locked into an unadaptive state. Hence, we use hypnosis. Now, if you're a parent, you want your adolescent child to be responsible. So then the first question is, does the adolescent have the idea? And most adolescents understand responsibility and parents don't need to explain to the adolescent, you need to be responsible and here's why. The adolescent already has the idea, they need to have a conceptual realization in the form of, oh, oh, I can be responsible. Now that may take joining a sports team, falling in love, getting a job. Something will happen that transforms an idea into a conceptual realization, which then may move into a belief, I can be responsible, a concept, I will be responsible, an orientation or a belief, which leads to a state, I'm being responsible. That state can be a reference experience that leads to an identity, I am a responsible person. But we're not going to get somebody from the idea to the identity by giving them information. Responsibility is something that needs to be realized by some evocative experience that may generate an idea into an identity or take somebody through a series of stages that get to that identity. So in psychotherapy, we want to learn how to use limbic communication and limbic responsiveness. And uh, that's been something that I have learned by studying artists. Our media literacy is forgotten when we get into the consulting room with the patient, also can be forgotten when we're talking to our children or we're teaching our students. And signification is the basis of art. 
The great Spanish painter Juan Miró uh, went to Holland and studied the classical master Jan Steen, and Rembrandt had his style, but Monet had a different style. So art is about signification. And this is a series called Dutch Interior. This is uh, what a Dutch tavern looked like. The painting is teaching a cat how to dance. And you have the boy laughing raucously, the dog, the blue skirt, the flute. You can't see it too well, but there's a, a man looking in through the window, the musical instrument. And Miro, an evocative, whimsical painter, decided he would repaint Jan Steen's masterpiece. And this is Miro doing something that is essentially evocative in comparison to something where no, there's no photography. And so we had to rely on a painter to be technically brilliant about showing us what existed in the past. And then that led to the freedom to be an expressive communicator, an evocative communicator. These paintings are the same uh, in terms of their content, but this is the photograph, this is the evocation. Rembrandt looked like Rembrandt. But when Manet, when photography was invented and Manet could be impressionistic, he no longer had to be a technician of the sort of Rembrandt and he could prevent, present something that would make you the co-creator of the art. Something that Camilo mentioned, that the therapist is a co-creator and is co-created by the experience and we want to in, enjoin somebody to be a co-creator of the realization that they need to have. I'm going behind in time, so I had a connection exercise, but I really don't have the time to do that with you. Um, this is uh, about our intention. It's not about being an actor. It's about intention. Now, actors do learn that when you have something that you want to communicate, if, if uh, a great Shakespearean is doing Hamlet, that Shakespearean actor knows an intention to say the lines, uh, or say about Romeo and Juliet, I think about that, where Romeo says, what light in yonder window breaks, it's the east, and Juliet is the sun. That's a wonderful metaphor, two metaphors, Juliet is the sun, and what light in yonder window breaks, it's the east, and Juliet is the sun that becomes memorable to us because it's presented as an evocative metaphor. If I asked each of you, what does Juliet as the sun mean? You might have a different interpretation, but we would all agree that Romeo thinks Juliet is really special. And how we set our intention before doing a hypnotic induction, what is your intention? before telling a therapeutic story, what is your intention? Before using a metaphor with a patient, what is your intention? And allowing uh, us to develop a technology where we can communicate at the very least, of course you can, of course you can change, of course you can cope adequately with difficult situations, of course you can. And Erickson was a living legend about that. I'm writing uh, his, biography right now and trying to communicate some of the spirit and some of the genius of Erickson. So hypnosis, my specialty, is essentially evocative communication. We don't use hypnosis to give people information. We use hypnosis to stimulate a realization. And hypnosis has more to do with art than it does with science. And it's a, an art of awakening a series of representations in someone that they will integrate into a whole that they will call hypnosis. And it's an essential foundation of conceptual communication for therapists, but shouldn't be understood as the end of therapy. Hypnosis teaches people to communicate concepts and not information. And once you do that, you can dispense with doing the formality of an induction in favor of being evocative by using metaphor stories, signifying experiences, sounds. Uh, uh, you know, if, if a movie maker can use sounds to communicate uh, concepts, then why don't I use sounds to empathize with the client or use sounds to provide a suggestion about something that the client can do differently? Uh, you know, a joke, well, that's uh, an induction for humor. 
and uh, an induction of hypnosis can be similar to a joke. I'll take the privilege of having the microphone and tell one of my favorite therapy jokes. So there's a rabbi who's a counselor, and the rabbi has a junior rabbi, and he's going to see Mr. and Mrs. Schwartz, and he says to the couple, can I please uh, have my junior rabbi sit in in the counseling session that I'm going to do with you? Mr. and Mrs. Schwartz agree. And Mrs. Schwartz comes in first, and for 20 minutes, she cannot say one good thing about Mr. Schwartz. She tells every terrible habit that he has as a husband, uh, as a father, uh, uh, as a companion. She can't say anything good. 20 minutes passes, the rabbi stops her and says, Mrs. Schwartz, uh, I have to tell you, you're absolutely right. And I am so proud of you that under these difficult circumstances, you have done such a good job of keeping your family together. Mrs. Schwartz melts. She says, Rabbi, thank you so much. It's exactly what I needed to hear. I think I can go on from here. Thank you. And she leaves. Mr. Schwartz comes in. And for 20 minutes, he cannot say anything good about Mrs. Schwartz as a companion, as a wife, as a mother. Can't say anything good. 20 minutes, the rabbi stops Mr. Schwartz and says, Mr. Schwartz, I have to tell you, you're absolutely right. And I am so proud of you that under these difficult circumstances, you've done such a good job of keeping your family together. He melts. He says, Rabbi, thank you so much. That's exactly what I needed to hear. I got it. I think I can go on from here. He leaves. The student is beside himself. The student says, Rabbi, that's not counseling. You, you, you listen to Mrs. Schwartz. And for 20 minutes, and you told her she's absolutely right. And then you listened to Mr. Schwartz for 20 minutes. You told him that he's absolutely right. Rabbi, you can't do that. The rabbi says, I've got to tell you, you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> so if I want to stimulate humor, if I want to awaken that representation, I have to tell a joke. I can't say one, two, three, laugh. The joke is an induction that leads, that stimulates and awakens a representation of humor, and it's the tension of the joke that allows the humor to happen. And hypnotic inductions are plagued by, uh, they're like a lullaby, rather than uh, a, uh, an active experience with uh, the rise and fall of tension that is uh, present in a joke. So. Problems just happen, states just happen, implicit responsiveness happens. This is part of our evolutionary design. You can't say to somebody, love me, and here's four reasons for loving me. These, all of these reasons are very logical. You have to do something evocative to awaken that representation. And it requires using some of these signifying methods that are fundamental to our evolutionary sociobiology. Now, Typically, what therapists do is they interpret the meaning of the client's signified symptom. So if the client has a pain in their back, the therapist intelligently says, who's on your back, as, a, as an attempt to understand the meaning of the client's symptom. Now, if the client is intelligent enough to have a symptom that signifies something, the therapist should be equally intelligent and communicate on multiple levels ways that the client can begin to realize um, that not only the patient can talk on multiple levels, but the therapist can talk on multiple levels. So in psychotherapy, problems are limbic. They're not cortical. This is the human brain. This is a diagram. This is the um, spinal cord, the cerebellum, blinking, breathing, digestion, all of the autonomic functions the limbic system, the mammalian brain, which works on uh, fight, flight, freeze, fold, uh, cling, um, and mostly flee when there's a threat, the limbic system, the accelerator. <laughs> and then the neocortex on top of that, the medial frontal precortex, the brakes. And it says, well, don't just lie and steal, do things the hard way, you know, restrain those limbic impulses. Problem is that the accelerator often turns out to be stronger than the brakes. 
and we need ways of reaching into the accelerator because problems are limbic, then the therapist should be a master at using communication that's limbic. And all of this comes from the field of art. So I had a project called emotional-impact.com. And what I did starting about 10 years ago is I started interviewing artists painters and composers and architects and poets and try to understand how do artists think about evoking a response. And uh, I was blessed because I met Stan Lee, the creator of Marvel comic books. I met Richard Sherman. Both of them got presidential art medals the same year, which is better than uh, getting a, 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 uh, uh, an Oscar, better than uh, um, so so uh, I was able to talk with them about deconstructing their art, trying to understand how artists think about influence so that I could establish a, a methodology of helping therapists use their media literacy to understand how to communicate in a way that's more limbic and that has to do with the implicit responsiveness that we're designed by evolution to have. and. Uh, uh, we're much less the captain of our ship than we think about. So this is a, an Olympic example. Oh, I don't think that this transferred. I'm sorry for that. No, no. it's just a, 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 um, a montage of birds flying in synchrony and fish schooling in synchrony. And you see that there's no intention that's involved, but very complex behavior of moving in synchrony with each other, which has an adaptive purpose. I'm sorry that didn't transfer. So you know, for those of you who need something empirical, signification in the various forms that I'm talking about is heavily researched in social psychology, how we respond to demand characteristics, context, authority and other forms of communication that's not necessarily mediated by consciousness. So uh, my area of explanation is, uh, exploration is about this evocative communication, metaphors, signification, the strategic nature of communication, how those can be linked together to create evocative experiences that help to promote realizations that transform people from states that are not so adaptive into states that are adaptive. <laughs> so I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. De seguida, usará a palavra o reitor da Universidade Fernando Pessoa. O director da Universidade Fernando Pessoa will speak now. Dear Professor Camilo Loredo, thank you very much for being godfather of so eminent personality we have today to honor in our university, dear members of our faculty and our staff, dear president of our student union, representative of all students of our university, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear Dr. Zaig. I have to confess that I do not have sufficient competence to deeply enjoy your intense intellectual endeavor since in the early 1970s, you fell in love with Dr. Milton Erickson's work on systemic psychotherapy and hypnotherapy. I have, however, the curiosity of those who love science with conscience to allow me to punctuate this solemn academic act with some considerations that reveal the institutional and cultural spirit of our university community. As he wrote five centuries ago, the great French philosopher and physician, François Rabelais, science without conscience is but the ruin of the soul. So I believe that only science with conscience can be positively 
at the service of humanity can help us to understanding of the complexity of the human being in his personality, in his character, in his behavior and attitudes as root causes of the formation of the social self and the structuring of a society. Because consciousness, as Bergson has simplified, means, first of all, memory. And memory, as we know it, is the repository of the dark and luminous times that bind the human being to the progress and sometimes to the regressions of civilization. And civilization is not more than a free affirmation of moral conscience molded into universal values of respect for the transcendence of the life rationally understood and enjoyed without theocratic constraints and political, cultural, economic or scientific dictatorship. It is that, as Herodotus taught us, of all the misfortunes that afflict humanity, the most bitter is to be forced to have the conscience of much and the control of nothing. And consciousness, Rousseau metaphorized, is the voice of the soul, the patience being the voice of the body. This dual, non-binomial unity of soul and body to which she sustains life was always thought by the philosophers of antiquity, such as Democritus and Plato, among others, before those who, in the Middle Ages and later in the Renaissance, reread and updated them, like Thomas Aquinas, Avicenna, Averroes, or Maimonides. If Democritus, enlightened thinking advocated that uh, we should focus more on prevention than on cure, and that it should not be forgotten that the disease of the body is produced by the passions of souls, not subject to reason, because unlimited pleasures are true foci of the pathology of suffering, also Plato's teachings insisted that one cannot heal the body without knowing the soul, and concluded, as in the famous Phaedrus dialogue, that no one can heal a body without being aware of the nature of the whole, that is, of the dual unity, body and soul. When in this dialogue it is argued that the control of the rational or the logical can be done by dialects, and that of the rational or concupiscent can be done by persuasions, the first leading to catharsis and the second to enchantment, here we have the beginnings of modern psychotherapy. The healing sleep referred by Plato that took place in the Hellenic temples consecrated to Asclepius, especially in Epidaurus, was the ancestry and the preceding religious ritual of hypnotherapy. This lunar liturgy of the temples of Asclepius, during which Hypnos, god of sleep, the son of the goddess Nyx, that is the night, with Erebos, that is the darkness, brother of Thanatos, that is the death, and father of Morpheus, the drowsiness, was worshipped, is undoubtedly the best mythical allegory in which we can also look at the foundations for the scientific journey that hypnosis has made since the Scottish surgeon James Braid introduced the concept into therapy, assuming it with the sense of inducive <coughs> of inducive sleep, inductive sleep. This path will be followed by Franz Anton Mesmer, the, Vien the Viennese physician who, in 1774, created the so-called mesmeric passes or manual gestures provoking magnetic effects of restoring the imbalance of body fluids, giving rise to mesmerism, which allowed to induce altered states of consciousness, 
allowing a kind of hypnotic anesthesia. Mesmerism was, however, quickly confused with the slate of hand by the Viennese scientific community at the time, which expelled Mesmer from Vienna, forcing him to move to Paris, which, though more liberal and open to innovation, also did not resist the pressure of the emerging science chemistry, submitting this practice to the analysis of a committee formed by Antoine Lavoisier, the president, Benjamin Franklin and Joseph Ignace Guillon, who banned the procedures of hypnotic anesthesia. As a result of this scientific intolerance, a disciple of Mesmer, the English physician John Eliotson, founded in London the first mesmeric hospital as a way to con counteract the scientific intolerance of those who did not understand and did not want to understand the hypnosis. That, nevertheless, continued to have important defenders, as were the French Charcot, who proved the hypnosis in the treatment of hysteria, the also French Libault and Bernheim, who founded the School of Nancy, in which hypnosis passes from the medical field to that of psychology, even Pavlov, the Russian neurophysiologist initiator of the scientific psychology of behavior, Dave Elm, an American radio man, comedian, composer, and writer, who is practically the creator of hypnotherapy as a method of behavioral induction. His books, Findings in Hypnosis in 1964, is still a reference today. And the last link in this decisive chain for scientific affirmation and for the strengthening, the strengthening of hypnosis and psychotherapy, the American psychiatrist Milton Erickson, founder of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, of whom our honorary today is a disciple and qualified continuator. I overpassed the Abbe José Custódio Faria because Professor Camilo Laurier referred to him very, very well. We are well aware that despite much scientific evidence already produced about the altered status of consciousness, and hence also about hypnosis, there are still those who are suspicious of these methods of soul searching in the name of a scientism that, as the Portuguese physician, writer and plastic artist Abel Salazar wrote, is a real threat to the development of a free and truly universal university where everything that has to do with man in his corporeal and transcendental dimension, must be able to enter. Here, Dr. Zeig at the University of Fernando Pessoa, because we cultivate the, university of, the universality of concepts and encourage the diversity of ideas, we are those who, because we know that scientism is a threat to the diversity of our looking at us and that relationship with nature, we persist. We persist in permanently reconnecting the past to the present time as the only way to understand the evolution of the human being in his inexorable march towards the future. An unknown dimension of the time that nevertheless upholds the utopia with which we fulfill the myth of the eternal return, just as Nietzsche well enunciated. And in those past times, men lived with the myths, feared the gods, believed in the stars as influences of his life, worshipped nature by constructing it, sorcery, beliefs, and superstitions. He became ecstatic and frightened by shamanism. He gave himself irrationally to the religion before the long racial journey that, from the 16th century onwards, began searching for the how and why of things, technologically reconfiguring its what for, sometimes to ethically questionable limits, because technology has been sadly obliterating philosophy and those who look to technology not as a means, but venerate it as, a, as an end, have contributed to a disturbing change of the world, eventually thickening from those to whom Hable prophetically referred in this time. And I quote, I know many who could not when they must, because they would not when they could. 
We, Dr. Jeff Zaig, here at the University of Fernando Pessoa, we will continue, despite the stones on the way, to build our dreams, seeking without fail the conciliation of must or have to be as an ethical imperative with can or may, as a manifestation of free will and responsibility not to be conditioned by taboos nor by frontiers of science, and even more, by an acceptable frontier guards or by oracular vestal of temples that want to be the prophets of the future when they completely ignore the past, of which this future, if we have one, will not be more than its present. We thank you, therefore, for having agreed to become one of us, enriching our and your university with the knowledge that you have also planted here at the Hypnosis and Psychotherapy Research Center affiliated with your foundation, Milton Erickson Foundation, and that's the moment to thanks to Dr. Agustinho Almeida and his colleagues to present your name to our Director of Faculty of Human and Social Science to being in our Hector's Council, the defender of the appointment of your title of Dr. Honoris Caus by our university. Thank you to them and thank you very much to you that uh, from today our maxim, nova et nove, that means doing different to do better, we are going to do better with your presence in our community, university community, and that's why I'm inviting you to continue helping us to do research on hypnosis and psychotherapy. Thank you very much. Convidam-se todos os presentes para de pé ouvirmos o hino nacional. We would like to invite you to stand up in order to listen to the Portuguese national anthem. Agradecemos a, a vossa atenção para o seguinte. A ordem de saída será, primeiro, todas as pessoas que estão no palco, seguidas pelos professores trajados e depois, por ordem das filas, o homenageado, o seu padrinho e o magnífico reitor da Universidade Fernando Pessoa aguardarão no átrio pelos cumprimentos. We would like to call your attention to the following. The exit order will be, first, all people who are on stage followed by teachers in gowns and then by the order of the rows. The honoree, his godfather and the rector of University Fernando Pessoa will wait in the lobby for the compliments.